Hello everybody, everybody who is watching this wee video and hello everybody who is here. Hello, hello. It's wonderful to be here. We are here in one of the most paradisic, par it's a paradise where we are here. We are in the office of the Instituto Humana by Sandro Ruggeri. Ruggeri. It is about 60 kilometers outside of Belém on an island and it is in the middle of rainforest. The monkeys are here on the, on the trees and the leguans and uh, all kinds of, of animals and snakes. So we are around it, surrounded by something that is just a miracle. We are in the middle of a miracle and this office of Sandro is another miracle. It's just a paradise. So we are in the Instituto Humano near Belém and Belém is the uh, capital of the state of Pará of Brazil and here is we are in the middle of the Amazon. So I we have here our 33rd annual dignity conference and this time it's a very mobile conference from one place to another place to another place and now this conference just started in Belém and we have guests who came 42 hours traveling from Thailand so we have a very and and uh, Sandro he has roots from Italy and from uh, from uh, Barcelona so we are here the world is united in the middle of the rainforest which is a wonderful thing so the title I, I made this when I was with my father in Germany, I made this talk and I gave it, the, I didn't know what to call it and I gave it the, the name Please Meet and Connect. I think it's a very good title, you know, it fits en, Encontre et Connecte. So I think that this title fits much better than I knew. So whoever wants to contact me, uh, my uh, email address is here and I'm happy to, to respond. So I would like now to thank everybody who is here and I want to... Um, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely, extremely thankful to Sandro that he takes care of us now. Extremely thankful and extremely thankful you, to you, a comrade and Pia Chat, that you came all the way from Thailand. So this is my thank you picture. This is my father. Now I will tell you a bit more about where I come from. My father, you see him before the Second World War started in Silesia on the farm he was to inherit on his horse. A young man looking forward to a bright future with his own big wonderful farm and many ideas about organic farming. Then came the Second World War he didn't want to become a soldier. It is the choice between being killed or being a soldier. And the place where he comes from is here. It's today Pol Poland. Today it's Poland. So here is the place where he comes from. Where he fa his parental farm was. This is 1945. All the big cities in Germany looked like that. Many big cities in Japan looked like, like that. Osaka, Tokyo looked like that. Only the small cities were a bit saved. But this is Berlin here. So 1945, everything is destroyed. 1948, it is as if the world was so shocked by what happened, this destruction, that they managed, we as a human family, we managed to adopt the Human Rights Declaration in 1948 in Paris. And without this woman, it might not have happened because she was really strong, Eleanor Roosevelt. I am, and this, the, the, the core sentence of, is, of this declaration is, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. The core sentence. This is me. I'm born 
six years after the declaration of the human rights. There you see my father, you see he has lost one arm in the war, 19 years old, he lost one arm, he lost his beloved elder brothers, they died in the war, then he lost his farm and then he lost his homeland because about more than 10 million people were removed from that area where he was at home, they were forcibly removed, forced out because uh, that Silesia was part of Germany before the Second World War and became part of Poland after the Second World War. So here my father is, no bright future anymore. He is an un unwelcome, basically unwelcome displaced person. You know, these millions of people who were after the war displaced, some of them were transported to Siberia. Nobody had control over where they were transported to. By accident, my father was transported to what became West Germany later. So here he is, one of all these many, many people who suddenly came to where, uh, the rest of Germany that was destroyed. Nobody wanted them. Uh, if you were strong, you could work in the fields. He could not even work in the fields with one arm. So here you see a, ma a man who, whose life has been taken by history. And he's deeply traumatized. When you see him there, he smiles. He's profoundly traumatized. And my parents had two rooms of this, in this house there. This is the farm. My first six years on this farm. And my parents had two little rooms there. So my parents were profoundly traumatized by war and then the displacement that followed and the loss of everything and the dispersal of, of the family, partly dead, partly dispersed. And my father never wanted to be in war. He tried to, uh, uh, to um, resist the war and he was almost executed for I resisting the war. So here they pay a price for something they did not want. So my father would say, Hitler has raped me, Germany has destroyed my life. And this is in, in the middle of Germany. So you see this extremely complicated situation into which I was born. I did not suffer there on this farm because luckily the owners of this farm were very kind to me. I was a little child since I was a baby and I was included in the farm. My parents suffered because they knew they were, you know, there was no place for them basically, but I was happy there the first six, of my uh, six years of my life. So what I do now with my work is basically recreate that kind of community uh, atmosphere. It was a wonderful community of animals, of people. So. Out of this experience of, you know, being born into an identity of here where we are, we are not at home and there is no home for us to go to. This is the identity of displaced people like my family. This identity motivated, and, and the trauma of my, my father especially, motivated me to develop my life not as a normal life, but as a kind of project, a kind of mission. And what would be the kind of title of my mission, it would be, is it possible that we as humans never again go to war? Is it possible? Are we able to do that? Is it possible never again war and genocide? Can we stop the ecocide and sociocide? Socio ecocide means the destruction of the ecological environment and sociocide means the destruction of the relationships between people. Is it possible? Perhaps we, are, we humans cannot do it. Perhaps we are not able to do a better job on this planet. But if we are possible, what, if we are able, what must we do? And what are the greatest obstacles? This is my life mission, to find out. So at the age of 20, I started to live globally. In the beginning, I did it without really knowing why. I only understood later what I was doing, namely living globally with the aim to understand all people, humankind, to understand who are we, human beings, 
in different cultures, what can we do in terms of love, in terms of hatred, you know, to what, what are we capable of? So, um, uh, at the age of 45, I had lived globally so much that my feeling or my identity of not belonging to humankind, that I have no place on this planet, being coming from this displacement, this sense of not belonging anywhere changed to belonging everywhere. So now, if you ask me where are you from, I would say I am from planet Earth. I'm at home on all continents, I've never been a tourist, I've never traveled, I have never been a guest, never done field work, like looking at people and studying them, like in a zoo. I have been embedded into many, many cultures all around the world since now 45 years. So I can say, I would say that I'm a world citizen and uh, I was uh, explaining Gary Davis' work with the world passport. He told me, you are, you really deserve the world passport. And I have written many books and I can send you the PDF files. This has been translated into Chinese now. Our friends took, uh, it is a book that was published in 2006 and they took so many years to translate it in their free time and to get it through the authorities and <laughs> it is now in summer it came out in in Chinese so uh, and this is a book a dignity economy in 2012 and it has been translated here in Recife into Portuguese so I have the PT PDF in Portuguese a dignity economy uma uh, economia dig digna and this is the book uh, 2017, Honor, Humiliation and Terror, and this is the book I'm to finish now, uh, From Humiliation to Dignity. It's the book that should be finished and is not yet finished. This is a very, very, very important moment in my life, because you could say that my life project, it is as if I am the arm that my father lost. You see here, you see he has lost this, his arm, as if I am the arm he lost. And I try to heal him, you know, also, also his trauma with my work. My work also heals him. But he did not understand that, because most of my work was in English. So he had no idea what I was doing, basically, all these years, until 2006. I got a prize in Switzerland and I uh, gave a talk in German and my father and my mother and others in my family, they came there. For the first time they understood what I do. And for the first time he understood that it is for him, it's a gift to him, my life is also a gift to him. So this is a very, very important moment for me. And this um, in global living is, um, has somehow kind of tra transported me into a, what you could call a bird's eye perspective, an astronaut's per perspective on our planet, on us human beings, Homo sapiens, you know, we, the, the species Homo sapiens that we all are. Who are we, Homo sapiens? We are no elephants, we are no giraffes, we are no chimpanzees. Who are we, Homo sapiens? This is a very nice um, website that um, is made by the Bradshaw Foundation where you can see how we started. About 200, 300,000 years ago, we find a fossil signs of us on this planet. And it's, uh, we started, at, as it seems, we started in Africa and then we somehow populated the whole planet. So the first 97% of our history, on, on our, of our journey on this planet, the first 97% was a party, a win-win situation. We could always go further, always go further, always go further and find and follow the food. Find lots of wild food. We could follow the food. And you see that the planet, if the planet were bigger, larger, we would still do it. But the planet is, is limited in size and I, to my view, and this is a huge discussion, I simplify it now hugely, um, 
if you see, you know, here about 10,000, 12,000, 11,000 years ago, there is an abrupt change. So the past 3% of our history are m dramatically different from the first 97% of our history on this planet. And my explanation is that simply the fact that the, the uh, surface of the planet is limited, this fact became significant. I, uh, you know, it's a very simpli simplified expl uh, explanation. In anthropology, they speak about circumscription. Circumscription means limitation. So circumscription means that suddenly something is, is limited where you thought it was unlimited. So he, I think that about 10,000 years ago, 11,000 years ago, we humans, we Homo sap sapiens, we encountered the fact that the planet is limited in size in so far as we could not that easily go further and further and follow the wild food. It was in certain areas of the world, it was we were stuck in a way. The next valley was already, already taken by other people and we stayed in our valley and we began with agriculture. This is the famous Neolithic Revolution. The famous Neolithic Revolution where we started agriculture and scientists, for example, the uh, uh, Robert Carnero who developed the circumscription theory, he shows that this change is the start of this change is circumscription, limitation, not agriculture. Agriculture is a, a, a consequence of that. So, uh, something very, very, very dramatic happened about 10,000, 11,000 years ago. Other things changed then also. The climate change changed, the ice age was over. So, there are many changes. So, uh, scientists are in discussion and there are big debates on what happened there and how, how to de explain. Uh, my explanation is circumscription, limitation. You s and it's, it's very, very clear, I think. Here we, we, we had populated all the, we, it, it, I call it the first round of globalization. We, fi we finalized, it is the end of the first round of globalization. Okay, so now I have a different way of showing what happened. The first 97% of our history, we could just always go, go further. We lived in small groups. This is established. Small groups, quite egalitarian. When I say I respect myself so much and I respect you the same, we are on one line. This is one line. So the groups, small groups of people who lived then, and I think here in the Amazon, maybe there are still groups who live like that. Small groups, quite egalitarian and taking care of each other. And um, I use this lying eight to uh, symbolize this kind of togetherness. And um, Alessandro, if you could come here. Yes. Perhaps we can do that carefully, yes, and you give me, you see, we, we no, like no. that, you see, All like, right. if you look in the camera now, uh, yeah, right. like that, you see, we, we are making this lying eight. Mm. Yeah, mm. Yes. sure. So, what is so interesting about that, it's, it's the symbol for uh, the infinity symbol in mathematics, it yes. is the Möbius strip, yes. it has many names, it is also a symbol for non-dualism in East, Eastern uh, philosophy and I use it as a symbol for dialogue uh, with equal dignity under the condition of equal dignity why because now we are equal or equal you know and we are connected we are two this is non-dualism is we are two and one in at the same time we are not one if we were one I would do like we would be like that then we would be one okay if we we could also be two like that we are all alone or we even enemies, right. could, we could still be equal. And then we could also be like that if you, if you go a little bit down, you know, then especially in the past it was like that, that you were, for example, a woman and I was a man, then I would beat you 
or the, you are, if you were a slave, I would beat you, you know? Yes. So you would be down. And you would perhaps be looking up to me or hating me. So you see, this, this is a symbol for, uh, that I use. Now we are equal and we are connected. Sure. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so this is what I do. I use this symbol for dialogue and togetherness and solidarity and all these words, connect, connectedness, all these words. So what happened about 10,000, 11,000 years ago? What started to happen? What started to happen was that we humans, we created a hierarchy. We, we uh, started with agriculture, that means we controlled nature. We became the masters of nature. And we became the masters of slaves, of underlings. We built hierarchies. There were higher beings and lower beings. So we in, uh, kind of changed, we adapted to the fact that we were in a different situation now. We adapted in that way. Before we were in a win-win situation, it was a kind of party, we could always, we had enough to eat. Then we were in a, in a more difficult situation, in a win-lose situation, especially with agriculture. You don't want that your neighbor comes and steals from you what you, in, in uh, autumn, what you have planted in spring. So you get afraid, you uh, get some weapons perhaps, and then the neighbor sees that and get, gets afraid of you and gets some weapons. It's the arms race, an arms race that then starts. And with an arms race, there is almost always uh, war. At, even though it is to avoid war, the result is war. And in that context, you build hierarchical societies. And there is uh, a woman, uh, Rihanna Eisler, who coined the, the term uh, dominator model of society, dominator model of society, which means there is a strong man at the top, a strong man at the top, then uh, there are the women in the middle, they, ha in the, uh, they have to stay inside, inside the house, inside the city, and they have to raise the next generation. The young men are sent to the, um, to the frontiers, to the borders, where they have to learn to, uh, to feel that it is honorable and heroic to kill and die in, to defend their own people. This is the dominator model of society that we humans developed when we had to adapt to a situation where we are suddenly stuck in our valley. So this is the kind of past 3% of our history that we are living with everywhere, almost everywhere in the world. Perhaps here in the Amazon there are still groups of people who have not been touched by that. I'm not that knowledgeable of that. I would, I would rather, I, I would have to study more about indigenous uh, populations here in the Amazon to know who, how much they are touched by this circumscription, how much they became, be, become belligerent as a result. I have read a lot and have read that um, many people say, oh, indigenous mm, uh, populations, they, they are belligerent. So it must be that our human nature is to be belligerent, but per perhaps not. I have read a lot where uh, tri uh, groups of indigenous people became belligerent when there were mining companies coming in or others where the circumscription caught up with them. So I don't know how much circumscription has caught up here in Amazon, in the Amazon. So, but many, many, many societies in around the world have developed this dominator model of society. And in that, you know, if you look uh, at the term of humiliation, in that context, it is not a, a, a violation, it is a duty and a right. The father, the man, the head of the family, the man has a duty to beat his disobedient wife and children. It's not a uh, a violation. It's his duty. Or a king has the duty to routinely humiliate the people be below him. You know, he has the duty to even uh, punish them, uh, torture them publicly, to set an example, to force everybody to respect this hierarchy. The man has to beat his wife if she does not respect this hierarchy. And the wife, she has to uh, learn humility. She has to learn to respect this him as the as the master. 
The only people who can in this system become angry when they are humiliated are equals, like aristocrats among themselves. Like one aristocrat can ask another one, call another one to go to duel. The beaten wife cannot ask her husband to go to duel. <laughs> Only two aristocrats can do that. So in this system, humiliation is a violation only between equal ar aristocrats, elite members, but not down in the system. So this is the past. And if we look at this sentence, every human being is born free and equal in dignity and rights. This is as if we, as humankind, as a human family, stood in 1948 and turned around against the past 10,000 years and said, look, what we did the past 10,000 years to erect a hierarchy that some people are worth more than others, that they are slaves and that they are masters, that we think now is illegitimate. So we, we collapse this gradient Again, we go back to what we had before the Neolithic Revolution. This is what we do, we did with this declaration. And if you look at this sentence there, every hum human being is born free and equal in dignity and rights. In this system, this sentence would be completely impossible. Like, uh, if, you, if you think of societies that are very hierarchical still today, uh, let us think of Taliban, and, but uh, you know, you have this e also in very uh, right-wing Christian uh, contexts, you have it in all authoritarian contexts, then this, is, this sentence would go as, follow, as follows. Every human being is born unequal in rights and worthiness, and some are more free than others. That would be the sentence here. So here we have a huge turning point. We have basically the second huge turning point in human history today. In this, in, in, we live in that second turning point now. So uh, here, for example, this, if, you, if you think of Nelson Mandela, you know Nelson Mandela. Yeah. So he was born black, so he was born down. Okay. He went up, 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 up. He went to the white masters and he said to them, look, times have changed. No longer can you arrogate superiority. You can no longer say, okay, we are worth more and the blacks are worth less. You cannot say that anymore. Times have changed. Please come down, join us in the middle. We all need to meet in the middle. This is what he said. And he went to his black brothers and sisters and said, look, before you were used to, you learned that it is God's will or nature's order that black people are worthless. Okay? But this is not true. No. You know, to be put down like that is a violation of your human rights, of your human dignity. You have a right to get angry. You have a right to rise up. Now comes the big problem. The same happened in Rwanda. You have all heard about the genocide in Rwanda in 1994? Sure. Huge genocide in Rwanda. It's the same situation and the same years. The Hutu, Hutu means servant in the language of Rwanda, servant. The servants, they went also up. Oh, up, 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 up to the Tutsi, their former masters. And they did not invite them to come. No. What did they do? They killed them all. They tried to kill them all. So you see, if, if a human rights defender goes to people who are down and says, please get angry, <laughs> they can be, can be, genocide can come out of that. You have to do something? We make a little pause? Just ask him to There is the rain now coming, yes. huh? Uh, Evandro. Evandro, yeah, he, he will shut the door. As a, it's raining now. It's wonderful. Everything is ready for the rain to come. Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. So, you know, when we, 
let us imagine another example out of, outside of Rwanda. Let us ex imagine that you are social workers and you hear that the man in the, in the neighbor beats his wife. What do you do? You go to the neighbor and you, s you talk to the wife and you, s you ask the wife, you know, why do you accept being beaten by your husband? And she, said, she says perhaps, oh, because he loves me <laughs> and therefore he beats me. She has learned it. She has learned it. Okay, and then the social, uh, social worker says, no, you know, you don't have to accept that. Being beaten is not love. It's a violation of your, your dignity and your rights. So please get angry. But what should the social worker not say? He should not say, kill your husband now. Sure. So this is what I mean with coming together in the middle. And therefore, I do not use the word empowerment anymore. Because empowerment has no stop. It doesn't stop. I use the word entrustment. Because this invites into going together into the middle, into a new future together, rather than continuing humiliation and now humiliating the former humiliator, continuing the circle of humiliation. This is what happened in Rwanda, the continuation of circles of humiliation. And we, we want to end the circles of humiliation. We want to not do it anymore. We need to meet all together in the middle. So if we ask ourselves if the idea of equal dignity, okay, perhaps before the Neolithic Revolution, perhaps it was everywhere, in all groups, or because they were quite egalitarian, then the past 3% of our history, it seems to be gone. But was it really gone? Was it really gone? Was it really, how did it happen that in 1948 we suddenly somehow turned around? If we look carefully, then the idea of equal dignity was always there. But you, you, in many religious awakenings, also in, Ch uh, in Thailand, I'm sure, you know, and, and in Portugal, everywhere, Jesus, if you look at Christianity, a very egalitarian message. But what happened in the past 3% whenever such a philosophy or religion became institutionalized, it lost its mes message because then the context was a dominator context, was authoritarian. So in order to institutionalize, they became authoritarian and they betrayed their own message as a, f uh, and a consequence of institutionalization. So therefore in our work, we work with people, not with institutions, because institutions are always more like that still today. So uh, then there is a very interesting year in the year uh, 1757. In the English language, for the first time, the verb to humiliate changed its meaning. Until 1757 in the encyclopedias, it was a good a pro-social thing to humiliate. L like I said, it was the duty of the man to beat his wife if she was disobedient. In 1757, for the first time in the English uh, encyclopedia, to humiliate meant to violate the dignity of a person. So a very interesting turn, you know, exactly this 180 turn around that we have then 1948 in the Human Rights Declaration. It was preceded, before that we had already signs of it. And since 1948 we speak about human rights. When we speak about human rights, we forget that there was this sentence, every human being is born free and equal in dignity and rights. Dignity comes first. Why do we then focus on rights so much and not on dignity? Because, I think, because rights are easier to, to, uh, to define. Dignity cannot be defined, really. Dignity can only be shown Like I did with Sandro. Uh. <laughs> I think this is the problem with dignity. Dignity can really, it's very difficult to define it. Rights can be easily defined, but not dignity. So dignity is something that is extremely difficult to describe and to define. It's basically this, this inner desire to stand tall, to stand upright, to walk with the head up, 
not to be humiliated and in a society to be then together connected with other people who are equally uh, on the equal level, on the same level and connected with them on the same level. So that is to me my definition of dignity. I think this is the reason why it is so, so difficult to work with dignity and there are people ar around the world who say the term of dignity is useless. Autonomy should be the, uh, the, the word and I think this is, uh, is wrong. So um, now my question to you, why again why did we do that the past three percent of our, our history? Why did we um, build these dominator societies? As I said, I think circumscription is really, circumscription theory is a good, a good um, explan explanatory tool for that. If you look at Europe, in the 30 years war, 16, this is 1648, you see everybody against everybody. And I use the triangle to symbolize the dominator society. It's a, so there was one polity, one uh, state or one kingdom or one little smaller kingdom. You know, many, many, many small polities here, one against the other. Sometimes in alliance, but alliances were never stable. And what was the motto? The motto was, if you want peace, prepare for war. Peace is only achievable through militarization. This is the motto of the past 3% of human history. Everywhere, more or less everywhere. And the political scientists call it security dilemma. They, you know, people want to have peace, so they accumulate weapons to defend themselves. The other gets afraid, accumulates lab weapons as well. It is an arms race which almost leads automatically to lead to war. So the solution creates the problem. This is therefore it's a dilemma. And even the most peace loving f lord or king could not uh, escape it. Because he would be toppled by his own people or by the enemy. So this is the word we as human family, we were in the grip of the security dilemma. We were the victims of the security dilemma through the past 5% of our, 3% of our history, more or less in different degrees. And perhaps here in the Amazon some people were spared. I don't know how much. And now my question, can we overcome it? Can we escape from it? We should. Yes, we should must. be able. Yes. How? The only way to me is to really look at our planet from outside and we can, it, can do it now, we have this image. We can look at the planet from outside and see that we are one species on one tiny, tiny, tiny planet in the middle of the universe. And if we understand that we are one family, if we manifest, the, if we, we succeed in being a good family on this planet, then we can realize what Gandhi said. Gandhi said namely, there is no path to peace. Peace is the path. And security comes through peace, not peace through security. So this is the future. Whether we make it as a human c family on this planet, whether we make it to that future, I don't know. But this is the only way to my view. So therefore, I, my global life has turned out to be very useful to build a global family, the seed of, of this global family. This is what I do. I build the seed of this global family for the future. What is in the, stands in the way of it? What stands in the way of it? You know, in the past millennia, males learned that to be a man, you have to, it's good to be a hero. You should be a hero. You should be a man, not a woman. The biggest, the, the, the gravest insult to a man is you are a girl. So what is a man? A man is a fighter. A man goes into combat. He needs an arena to be a hero. He has learned that. You know, you have to learn that as a man. And what do we know today? What do we know? Today, it's not useful anymore. 
In the past, sometimes a short-term victory could be achieved. In the, in the past, but now the world is so interconnected, basically, and the weapons are so extreme, basically today this seeking a new arena for heroism, for malehood, this is, leads to a collective suicide of humanity. So, the identity of being a man stands in the way of a peaceful future, of a survival. So here we have this in Germany, you know, the, the German, the Second World War. The, 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 imagine there was a big, big, big group of people in a big stadium and the Josef Goebbels, he called, called out, Do you want total war? Do you want total war? And what did they say? Yes, we want total war. And what was the result? Total destruction. And I think this is a good, you know, wollt ihr den totalen Krieg? And this is the result. I think this is a good description of what will happen if we follow that script. So, here, what is humiliation? It's had, it, it has his, its roots in the Latin word humus, earth, to be put with your faith into the earth. In all languages there is a downward push. It's degradation, nedverdigelse in, uh, in Norwegian, erniedrigung in German, abaissement in French, I think in Portuguese it must be similar. Humiliation. Oh, humiliation, but humiliation. yeah, humiliation. humiliation. And in Thai, I don't know what in Thai would be humiliation. And to push down, hold somebody down, you know, make somebody helpless. This is humiliation. And what can you do when you feel humiliated? What can you do? You can do what the wife does when she says, oh, my husband uh, loves me, therefore he beats me. You can accept it. This is what happened in the past millennia very much. And still it happens today. What can you also do? You can get angry. This is what aristocrats did among themselves when they went to duel. This is what happened. Hitler followed this script of, of counter-violence and Rwanda followed this script, terror. If we look at, at the hate speech that is on the increase in uh, everywhere and the authoritarian leaders that are getting into power everywhere, and uh, they follow this speech, this script. They follow this script. And this is violent. Here, the first is, you don't see it, it's quiet. But here it's violent. So what is the future? What should we learn? What do we have to learn? We have to learn to do it like Mandela. He came from humiliation. He came from humiliation. But he did not follow this script of dueling, of fighting back. He didn't follow that. He did something else, lo loving so solidarity. I think this is the path, the only path, and here is this will lead to this kind of connected dignity that I, I showed before. Only that path. And then there is something else that stands in the way. First, you know, the, the identity of being a man, of being courageous, of being heroic, of being brave. That is one thing which once was, was good or sometimes good, and still, if you need a fireman here in the Amazon, he needs to be brave. Still today, you need bravery, we need bravery, but in a different way. So we have to th rethink th the identity of a man. And what do we have to th rethink also? I think we have to rethink economy. I call it security dilemma num number two. The old security dilemma, the classical one, was between states. One state is afraid of the other one. One polity is afraid of the other one. Here it is now the famous 1% against the rest. There is the kind of a frontier, fault line, between a very tiny elite, global elite, and the rest of the population of the world. They are kind of divided today. So here we see the Amazon, this is kind of the division. Here is the exploitation, this is the 1% the you can say who are exploiting and then the rest 
it's the, it's the, the frontier, the fault line goes between bo uh, the, the, and their motto before in the first security dilemma, the motto was, if you want peace, prepare for war. I think the new motto here is, if you want wealth, invest in uh, exploitation. This is the motto we, we experience here now in the Amazon ev because fires are being uh, started and uh, to clear the forest and uh, so it is following this motto, if you want wealth, invest in uh, exploitation. It's everywhere. I see it all around the world when I go around the world, this motto. Everywhere there is exploitation for profit maximization. How can we overcome that again? If we understand that we are one family on one tiny vulnerable planet, then we can overcome that. And then we have to change this system. We cannot live with it. We cannot achieve a sustainable future if we stay with that old system. We have to keep in, uh, we have to realize globalization of care, trust and responsibility. No longer globalization of exploitation. So that is the future, our task for the future. I think many people who are older still remember that smoking was once declared healthy. <laughs> once it was advertisement that said smoking is good for you. And now we know smoking kills. And I would say that business, you know, this sentence, which I hear everywhere when I talk about this, then I hear the sentence, but Evelyn, you are, you are a dreamer. Business is not a charity. Only profitable business is healthy. I think this is exactly that. Smoking is healthy. And we know it's deadly. I think this sentence is deadly. It's a very similar logic. It's just a little bit later. We understand it now. We understand now. This is here a cartoon. You see the world is destroyed. You see here New York in ashes. And the people sit in front of New York. And they say, yes. The planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for share, shareholders. This is our situation today, and this is the path we are walking now. And here is another cartoon. I know it from the 1970s in Egypt, 1980s. This is a tree, and there is a rope, and there is a, a kind of uh, tire. tire or so, or something round, this is what is needed, okay? <laughs> and what do the engineers w uh, install? What do they install? They install that. They cut the tree, <laughs> they put some artificial support, and then they put another thing, not a round thing, another thing in between. <laughs> so it's a construction that basically does not work. And is much more complicated than what is needed. So I think what, it's a very good, uh, cartoon for the situation we are in. We need what is here in the Amazon called bien vivre. Huh? Yeah. How do you say? Ben vivre. Ben, ben vivre. Ben vivre. Bien vivre in French. Huh? Yeah. Ben vivre. Well, well being. Huh? Good living. Good, good living. living. We need good living. It's very easy. It's solidarity. Solidarity with each other and with nature, with our surroundings, with the habitat we are depending on. Very easy. And what we do is something very complicated. We cut everything, we, we burn the forest, we cut the tree on which we, de and we, on which we depend, we build some kind of artificial uh, support, and the whole thing is completely unsustainable. So this is, I think, also another cartoon that shows how absurd it is what we do. In Africa, they gave me that. They say, look, Evelyn, we fight with each other, for example, blacks against whites or so, we fight, but it's completely useless to fight. We will all be eaten by the crocodile. <laughs> <laughs> so don't, we, let's stop fighting solidarity so that we might escape from the croc crocodile's mouth. So this is what, what I said now is kind, kind of alluding to the commons dilemma. Have you ever heard about the commons dilemma? It's strange that it's so unknown, the commons dilemma. The security dilemma, okay, political scientists know about it. The commons dilemma, economists know about it. There was one, and, and what does it mean? The commons were once, for example, in England, a village had uh, grassland and that belonged to everybody. 
So everybody could put one cow, for example, there for free. And uh, now comes the dead dilemma. So th these are the commons. The commons are what is owned by everybody. And basically, if we look at our planet, we all own this planet together. It's our commons. We could say that. And uh, so, what, what is the commons dilemma then? If one person puts two cows, says, okay, I, I want a little bit more, I put two cows, okay? If many, many people put two cows, they will eat all the grass, the commons will be destroyed. So, there needs to be some kind of social control that hinders that people put two cows or three. There needs to be kind of surveying that otherwise the commons will be destroyed. And this is what happens with our planet now. The, our planet is our commons, but the exploiters go and destroy it. So, we are victims of the commons dilemma at the moment in many ways. There was a, a man, James ha uh, Garrett Hardin, in 1968, he said, let's forget about looking at the planet or anything as commons because as, as soon as groups get bigger, larger, they cannot control it. So let's forget about that. We can't look at anything as commons that is a little bit bigger. So therefore, he, he defended in that way the economic system, the ex uh, existing economic system. And then came uh, Eleanor Ostrom, and in 2009 she got the prize, economic Nobel Prize, ec Nobel Prize in e Economics, for, s for showing that even larger group can do it. They can view something as commons and protect it from, from exploitation. So, I be believe that from the tragedy of the commons, the commons dilemma, we can, we have the possibility, we be basically in the first, first time in our human history, we have all the knowledge to overcome this tragedy and to, to create for us the blessings of the commons. We can, I believe, we have all the knowledge to perceive the planet as our commons, of, as our uh, joint shared uh, property or basically, or better, better to say, it is what we inherit from our children. We inherit our planet from our children and we can protect it. We have all the knowledge. If we understand that we are one family and that we act on this understanding, then we can overcome the tragedy of the commons. If we don't do it, or this is at the moment, I think, I see us at, as humanity, I see us as the Titanic. And I see the rich people on the top floor. And there they are well amused and badly informed. They uh, play games, video games, they paint their cabins pink, and they go make party, and then they make holes down here to make party, to burn it up up there and and so they make holes here and they party up there make lots of party and then uh, slowly slowly the poor people down in the boat they want to come up they suffer more and more and they want to come up and then the people up there they put barriers bigger and bigger and bigger barriers they don't want the others to come up and the, f the pe people up forget that the people down here like the indigenous people here they have a lot of knowledge that would make this ship sustainable. All the knowledge, lots of good knowledge is down in the ship, so that they don't rec recognize. They simply put, like burning the, the, the Amazon, is like making holes in the ship. Okay, this is what we as humans are busy with now. What we do, we, we amuse ourselves, we make party, we make holes here without noticing it, then we are astonished when the people from down want to, to flee and the, the people down are very busy in trying to survive and trying to flee. So we are busy with this. Okay, what do we overlook all of us? The iceberg. We, we overlook that the whole thing is so unsustainable we will crash. We will go down. If we continue like, like now, as I said, some 
very serious scientists believe that already in 10 years time this planet is no longer inhabitable for humans. So it's a quite rapid destruction now. So uh, a summary is, for, is the following that I made. I think we as humankind, we can no longer think of ourselves as sailing on a luxury cruise ship. The planet is not a luxury cruise ship. What we thought of as a cruise ship is a Titanic on its way to the iceberg. And this, while we have already punched holes in the hull of the ship to use some of the planks to throw dazzling parties on the upper floor. Slowly we realize that we are on a lifeboat, not a cruise ship. And on a lifeboat one has to act very differently. All hands are needed on deck. Everybody has to contribute with what they can. Nobody can buy themselves out of this joint effort. Whoever tries to gain short-term and personal advantages by exploiting others or ecological resources contributes to the faster sinking of the lifeboat. In fighting, we'll make it capsize and nobody will survive. So this is somehow, I think, a summary of the situation of where we are as humanity today. We think, many people think we are on a luxury cruise ship, but we are on a lifeboat. So, now a summary. Now I'm coming to the end of this, this chapter. A summary again. Where, who are we human beings on this planet? Who are we? We started around 300,000 years ago, which is very, very, it's a short second of the history of the planet. So we emerged. And first we had a party, a win-win situation, for a long time. Then, about 12,000 years ago, it start, start, the, a big change started. We encountered a new situation. The, uh, what I call the first round of globalization was finished. And we encountered a win-lose win situation. And we adapted by competing for domination. Building dominator societies, competing for domination. The security dilemma came up. The d commons dilemma was getting sharper. So, in 1757, I told you about the encyclopedia, and in 1948, equal dignity, the notion of equal dignity came up. I call it egalization. And with that, also a different kind of humiliation came up, dignity humiliation. Then, in 1967, we see our planet from outside. I think that is a revolutionary image, because when you travel from one from the place where you were born and you go to another place and you look at the place where you come from you see something completely new you see yourself in a new light i think we as human beings see ourselves or are able to see ourselves in a completely new light since we can look at us from outside 1980 we started to overuse our resources now we were, the overshoot day is end of july Already now we overuse, we use more than one planet. 1991, the end of the Cold War, the opportunity to build one family, one world of solidarity. We did not use that opportunity. We did not. Then, 2007 2008, the financial crisis, the collapse of the blind belief in the wisdom of the market. Now, what is our responsibility now? Can we create a new win-win situation in some way, completely different? Can we do that, perhaps? With, can we somehow escape from the systemic humiliation that we have now? Can we nurture an, a new form of civilization, a completely new form of civilization? Can we nurture that? Can we cooperate with our own evolution in a better way? Can we model, manifest steadfast love, really, love in our society with each other and with our habitat, ec ecological habitat. This is our, uh, our responsibility now. And there is one interesting uh, anthropologist who can show us the way, what we, how we can do it. He has researched many, many groups in the world and he says there are basically four ways to interact in a group. Communal sharing, authority ranking, equality matching, market pricing. 
communal sharing is what you do in a family. You give what you can, you get what you need. Authority ranking is ordered differences. It can be a good teacher, but also an oppressive dictator. Equality matching is exchange. I give you something if I get something back. Market pricing is I calculate the price and then we exchange. So that is here qualitative. This is the most comprehensive. And that is the narrow, the most quantitative. It is very narrow. So this is now we as humankind, we do the mistake, to my view, that we give priority to what is the narrower, the most narrow way of, being, of relating to each other. And we elevate that over the more comprehensive one. In a way, if we continue like that, we will sell our soul, we will sell our grandmother, we sell, we sell our, our planet, we sell our lives. This is because we give priority to market pricing. So I think we have the wrong priorities on this planet. And what I do with my work is to give priority com to communal sharing. I experiment with my personal life. I try to live as far outside of the market and I try to nurture as much as possible solidarity, what you do in a family. I experiment with my personal life with that. So again, a summary. First, 97% we were spreading out happily on this planet. Then circumscription hit. You know, the fact that the planet is, is limited. And we adapted by learning competition for domination vertical expansion. It, agriculture is to, to exta extract resources from where you stand. Now we are here. And what do we see now? What do we see now? Circumscription means that something that we thought was unlimited is in fact limited. Now we know. Clean water is limited. Clean air is limited. Minerals are limited. Everything is limited. Our planet is limited. We have never experienced it as sharply as now. So, in that situation, we hit circumscription again. We hit the wall once more. Very strongly now. Okay, I think in this situation we should think back 10,000 years. Okay, look at our adaptation. We, we adapted by learning how to compete for domination. We, we learned that. Now we should think, I think, in, in a situation when you feel, okay, what we have done the past 10,000 years, perhaps it was not a good thing. It doesn't function really. Uh, you, have two, when you have two choices when something doesn't function. Two choices. You can either say, we didn't do enough of what we did before. In this case, we didn't do enough competition for domination. We can maximize it. You can say either perhaps we didn't do enough from what we did before if something doesn't function anymore. And the other choice is you can say, oh, what we did before was wrong. We did need to do something new. So now we are here. We know our climate is collapsing. Many things are collapsing. We know what we do doesn't function. What we have two choices. Either, either we say we maximize what we did before. Perhaps we didn't do enough. Then the other choice, we have to do something new. Okay, what we do now, we choose to maximize what we did before. Uh, when you hear the news and you hear that there is a need for economic growth, we hear that in the news, we need economic growth. This is an exponential curve. And basically, we, we, you don't, nobody needs to be a mathematician to know that in a, in a limited context, you cannot have the forest will not grow one kilometer in the height. N natural growth is never exponential. It's an instable growth. It's, ha it's not a sustainable growth. Everybody knows that, basically. So we have to learn to go in circles. I think we know, we know that. And we have to learn to be in dialogue. This is what we have to learn. In, in a way, it's that we have to learn to say, look, what we did before is not functioning. We, do, we need to do something completely new. 
And now comes the question, people say, yeah, you are an optimist, you know, we would like to do it, but we can't. Yes, we can, because for the first time in our history, we can. We have all the knowledge, we see our planet from outside, we are in a, an extremely privileged situation, we are in a crisis situation as never before, and at the same time we have all the means to go out of it, to exit from it, to solve it. We have all the means. So there is one man, uh, his name is Ruben Nelson, he uh, impressed me. I uh, just heard he's the director of Foresight Canada and he gave a talk in San Francisco in February and it's on, uh, on the internet. Uh, this talk uh, was uh, impressive to me and he has a very similar analysis of our human history. Like we started after ne the Neolithic revolution here, you know. We started um, with small groups, then agricultural-based cultures, then regional uh, empires like China, the Inca Empire or Egypt. And then we have the modern, very complex industrial cultures here, and we are here now. And he says, okay, those people who, who think that this will continue are mistaken. Uh, because we are living beyond our ecological limits. We cannot go on like that. We are running out of affordable energy. We are disrupting the climate. So here we are here, we cannot continue. And the, uh, the social cost of, you know, the, the cost that societies pay is too high. So we will collapse. There is a collapse. He, he shows it like that. He says we are on the peak of modernity. We are here now, and when complex, complex systems collapse, they don't collapse slowly, they normally collapse quickly. And this is called Seneca Cliff. So when we, if we continue as we do now, then our societies will collapse quickly. This is the prediction. And uh, we can do something about it if we now start co-creating new civilization new models of civilization, new ways of living on this planet. This is this curve. This is a sustainable curve. And so he says we need to make this transition here. So if we continue just like now, then I call it, we, it's our future is hospice. If we try, if we make it here, then our future is hospital. We have, I think today, the uh, choice as humankind between hospice and hospital. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he says this you know we can do we have to 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 do to develop a new co-creative eco-personal culture we can do it and uh, if we don't do it we it's hospice it's not optional it is required and we cannot simply continue without thinking we have to intentionally consciously do it and we have no time to wait it must be done now and it cannot be done only on the local level or only on the global level or national level. It has to be done on all levels at the same time. And then he gives examples of projects around the world and I know very well the Great Transition Project. These are projects, uh, comrade, uh, around the world who are transition towns, who are already thinking. But what he says and what I also observe, none of these really think big enough. None think big enough. They think in all, we, still too much within the existing paradigm. And I observe that too. So here, territories of life, there is, when we, since we are in the Amazon here, the territories of life, indigenous and community conserved area, consortium, was formally established in Switzerland in 2010. It is an international association whose members are organizations and federations of indigenous peoples, local communities and their supporters, more than 150 at the moment, and individual experts and activists, nearly 400 from about 80 countries. Their uh, motto is love the land, love the people, share the surplus. And they have experience since 2010, and they say there is some kind of uh, success on the local level, some kind of success on the international level, where it is not succeeding is on the national level, so the, the, the obstacle is on the national level. 
And then if we look at the global level, we, I think most of us have heard of the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN. Here we see what? Number eight. We see the exponential curve. And I fear that this curve will undermine all the other goals. If this is, is continuing like now, it, it, the, the rest cannot work. So we commit, at the moment we commit ecocide, and uh, you might know Greta Thunberg. Yeah. She had a, a, a predecessor. A pre, yeah, uh, predecessor. And, yes, and no. her name was Severn Suzuki. I don't know. I didn't know. Yes, she came to the Earth Summit here in Rio de Janeiro in, 2000, in 1992 and she spoke exactly like to Greta, exactly the same message. And she impressed the leaders of the world who were present. He, she impressed everybody. And then 20 years later, in 2012, when Rio Plus 20 happened, she came back, 20 years older, and what did she say? She said, yes, there were a lot of reports written. A lot of ideas developed and perhaps some, some projects went into the right direction but this, she says overall nothing has happened in the past 20 years. Overall nothing has happened. So if we look at um, the world to up till now then we see that for example here uh, North Korea if we call that communism as it has been manifested then we see it's hugely unequal. There's huge inequality there. This is the picture down here is in uh, Sao Paulo. In 2012, you have Mar Morumba. You see the rich people look down on the poor. The rich look down on the poor. So all the, if we look at what we humans did so far on this planet, with the isms, capitalism, hum communism, communism, capitalism, all systems so far betrayed the, their own promise of well-being for all. We, all systems until now betrayed their promises. So, so far nothing has really worked. And in the West you see that, so suicide, the loneliness. In the UK a ministry for loneliness was in established now. Imagine a ministry for loneliness, sociocide, the human relationships are destroyed, hatred, hate speech everywhere, sociocide. So we have ecocide, we have sociocide. This is the result of what we do with our planet now. So when you look, this was the best quality of life was before the Neolithic revolution, the Paleolithic Paleolithic uh, gatherers and hunters. They were healthy and they lived a good life. And then basically you could say it, the first agriculturalists had much, much less health. They were much, uh, much shorter, for example. Their food was much, much less nourishing. So if we want to think about, we think about, you know, when I speak about communism and capitalism, it's, I don't want to speak about I don't want to use these words anymore because when I go and I speak in uh, among uh, conservative people in America they would throw me out if I use even the word social democracy they would throw me out they would say oh you are a communist we don't want we hate you <laughs> and it's hatred it's it's really deeply felt hatred or if I go into some context of unions, Labour Party, and I, I use the word um, capitalism, then I'm thrown out. So I, I don't want to use these words anymore because they are hate words. They have become hate words. So I, I think, do we humans need an ism? Perhaps we should learn to live without an ism. But if we need an ism, why not use dignity as an ism? Why not say dignity? Dignityism, dignism. And what would it be? It would be a world where every newborn finds space and is nurtured to unfold their highest and best, embedded in a social context of loving appreciation and connection. A world where the carrying capacity of the planet guides the ways in which everybody's basic needs are met. A world where we are united in building trust 
and respecting human dignity and celebrating diversity where we prevent unity from being pre perverted into oppressive uniformity. This is what I made, you know, not one, but two. And keep diversity from sliding into hostile division. You know, diversity must be connected, not like that. Now we burn our planet and we drown it. This is what we do now. Can we rescue it? Can we? Now I want to tell you what I do, my contribution to that. And for that I take another hat. Until now I always say, please don't believe a single word I have said until now. I don't want to convince anybody or to preach. I don't want to preach. I don't want to convince. I only want to share what I see on my global path as Evelyn. What I see, it's not open for debate, it's simply what I see. You might, you, if you don't believe it, please don't believe it. Think yourself. So I, I, I'm not a preacher. So I'm simply Evelyn who has lived globally for so many years and this is what I see. So now I take another hat. Now I take the hat of the founder of a global movement. So I explain to you now very briefly, this is now the end of, of me, <laughs> of my presentation. Now I just explain to you what this global movement is. So I take the other hat now. So the name of this movement is Human Dignity and Humiliation Studies. It's a global f fellowship of like-minded academics and practitioners, a not-for-profit labor of love, for a new future for humankind. And we have, uh, I, I do it together uh, with Linda Hartling in Oregon. She li lives in Oregon. And then we have a core group like Michael here, a core group here you see Dan, and here you see Gabi. Gabi. <laughs> yes. So we have, uh, so, you know, all together 7,000 people in our address list. And about 1,000 people in the core. Here you see Hjell, you see? This yeah. is Hjell. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and to me, this is the seed of the global fami dignity family that we need to build. This is the seed of it. And somehow the motto that we follow is never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. This is Margaret Mead who said that. I think it's a very thoughtful saying. And our group, our work has been awarded, has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize three times in 2015, 16, 17. And I'm not sure whether you know uh, that uh, Nobel, Alfred Nobel, he didn't have the ideas. It was Bertha von Suttner. She gave him the idea. So we are following her spirit in our wor work. We think that a lot of women have been very important, like Eleanor Roosevelt has been very important for the Decla uh, uh, Declaration of Human Rights, Human Rights De Declaration, and, and, and Bertha von Suttner has been extremely important for uh, the Nobel uh, Peace Prize, that this came into being. We have two conferences per year, uh, one in New York uh, each year in December, and you are all Everybody is invited to write and to register and to come. So in yes, this year it is the 5th and 6th of December in New York. And then we have a second conference each year in a different place. And so far we had conferences all over the world. This year now is the 33rd conference in Brazil. And as I said, it's a very different conference. It's a, a, a wandering, a mobile conference. Uh, we had some mobile conferences before already. Uh, and then the last one was in Egypt and the next one will be in Spain next year in September in Spain and this was the one now, now the last one in New York so this is the last one in New York this was the last one in September where you wanted to come Kamarad this was the conference in, in uh, Egypt and this is the conference that we had now in Marabah 
This is the group of Dan Baron, you know, where, whom we met now, where we had the first part of this conference that we are part of here now. And then we launched uh, an initiative, the World Dignity University Initiative. And Kamarat, you were uh, in interested in that initiative. It is um, a world, <laughs> here is still, I gave a talk uh, in, in Hamelin for the first time in my life in the place where I was born um, now before I came here and uh, I still uh, forgot to put here the English version of this slide it's still the German version of this slide so um, this is uh, an invitation to all the learners and educators in the world who want to nur nur nurture dignity to come together and to educate each other and to learn together and we have a publishing house, both for the publishing house and for the World Dignity University initiative, we need uh, a new um, dignity leader. Because I'm overworked, Linda is overworked, and the person who, Uli Spaltov, was the person who built this up, he is now tired, so we need a successor for somebody who leads the World Dignity University initiative and the Dignity Press. So you see here, my book, Dignity Economy, was the first book in the Dignity Press. Thank you so much. Yeah. <coughs> that you were holding out, you were almost falling asleep. I know you have been traveling so far, and how yes. can you hold yes. out such yes. a long talk so yes. and, and not fall asleep? I'm so grateful to you. <laughs> it's very holistically. <laughs>